Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next um, video on um, understanding cluttering with Yvonne von Zollen. And um, I'm sorry, I, I'll, I'll learn how to pronounce your name correctly. In the... You're doing better every time, Yvonne von Zollen. OK, OK. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't sound at all um, Dutch when I say your name. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this video because I think that this, um, I, I think the topic of this video is something that people are, uh, th that a lot of people are looking for, but there's not really very much information on the internet about, uh, um, about this. And, and I don't know if um, actually, uh, besides in your book, I don't know if there's very much information uh, um, out there, like non-internet um, too. So, so I'm very, um, I'm very excited for, um, for this and, and hopefully I didn't give away too much with my uh, introduction. So, uh, is that a good introduction or okay yes yeah okay, yes great. i think it's um um i chose the topic for today to be the conditions for therapy and um i think that um if i look at clients that has been to speech language pathologist or whatever whatever uh therapist uh, many of them say well the therapy didn't work and or speech language pathology didn't work and in many cases, um, I have some um, ideas about why it did not work or how, how you can make sure that your therapy works and has a long lasting effect. So that's what I wanted to discuss today. And if you, if you look at therapy, one of the biggest issues in cluttering is that people with cluttering are not bothered by it themselves. It's the people in their environment that are bothered by, by it the most. So in many cases, people come to therapy um, and they say, well, I have to come to therapy because my boss told me so, or because I cannot uh, make a jump in my, in my professional life. So there are external motivations for therapy instead of in, internal motivations that you normally have when you have like, an, uh, something that's aching you or is bothering you all the time. That's internal motivation. And that's something that we have to have to talk about before we can even think of starting therapy. So, and if you go to, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. And, um, and that's, uh, that, that kind of mirrors my experience too, because when I, um, when I was, uh, when I went when I went to the speech therapy, the um, the, the, dean, the dean of my college um, came to me and said, "Hey Joseph, um, hey, um, hey Joseph, um, I think you should um, I think you should see my friend who's a who's a speech therapist because and and, um, and then he uh, then he gave me a whole bunch of stuff that I was like yeah, blah 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 blah. Um, what, what, well, um, I I wasn't really listening to him, but um, but I'd always wanted to like improve my public speaking. So um, so um, so so anyway, I. Uh, that that happened to me is I um, I went because somebody else told me that I should go, um, not because I was bothered about my speech. And and I don't think I, I don't you think said, I've ever. You said something. You said something important. I have to stop you here. You said I went to therapy because I wanted to improve my public speaking. Mm -hmm. And it is so important to know what do people want to improve. So. You cannot cure someone from cluttering by giving him therapy. That's not how it works. So it's so important if a, if a person only has this external motivation to only work on that, that is very important for that particular person. So for instance, if I would uh, start training you with reading out loud because you want to improve your public speaking, that is only helpful if there's a relationship between the two. If there's none, don't do it. I will tell more about it, but that is a very important thing. You started therapy because you wanted to improve your public speaking. So I don't have to work on things that are not related to that. You will not be motivated. Uh, and that's um, that's a really good uh, that's a really good point. And actually, when I uh, when I went through speech therapy, then that uh, like my motivation for why it was there never actually came up. Um, so, so I don't think the speech, the speech therapist ever knew that um, stuff that would be really motivational for me would be stuff related to public speaking. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And and if in if you if that therapist asks you to to train things that you are already able to do, you will also not be motivated because then it feels stupid. And if you have to change your your way of speaking completely, like slowing down your speech, well, no one is interested in learning to speak like this. It doesn't work. Yeah, I would not do it. I wouldn't do it. So know why a person wants therapy and focus on that. That's, that is the first thing. And in my experience, many of the clients with cluttering uh, are capable of, are motivated to do so for two, three months and that's it. And that is a very funny um, thing because if you look at changing behavior we know that intensive training for two to three months can have a huge effect. Only if you have intensive training for 10 to 12 weeks, then the brain understands, hey, I should change something in my behavior, 10 to 12 weeks. And then you have to stop. And there's no reason to continue if you have, if you have reached your goal there you need to give time to the brain for some automatization to happen. And that will not happen if you continue training. This is a very important issue. But maybe we should first tell what the training is all about. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good point. And the, uh, in the previous videos, we already explained that if the, uh, if the person who clutters hears himself better that there is a change in speech behavior. Remember that I said with the headphones on that the, 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 the speech um, is way better. And that is called monitoring. So I hear myself speak a little bit better. And by doing that, I will improve my behavior. It's like looking in a mirror while you walk, you will change your behavior. It's like talking with, with um, heightened auditory feedback and you will improve your speech. This is, this monitoring is, um, is the only thing that we actually need to train in people with cluttering because they are able to produce good sentences, they're able to produce the right sounds, they're able to do everything. The only issue is that they do it too fast for my brain to process it. So I would like them to, to monitor their rate. It's not monitor their formulation, it's monitor the rate and the pauses. That, that's in essence what we need to do. And then, um, and, and you'll probably get into this, but what, what do you mean by monitor the rate? What I mean with monitor is um, focus on, on, the, on what you do and check is that what I want to be, uh, is, is that the way I want to sound like? Is this, is this the way I want to speak? Yeah, so sometimes if you uh, put people in front of a mirror, they stand like this, and then you, you show them the mirror, and it's like, ah, oh, no, no, this is not how I want to, I don't want to sit, be seen like this, I want to be seen like this, you know? So they monitor their, their, their posture in this case. So if I speak and I don't hear myself speak, that has an effect on my pro speech production. So if I hear myself better, then I also will listen more to the way I speak. And if I do things that, if I do things like that, I will hear it and I will correct it. So that's the monitoring. I'm aware of what I'm doing. I criticize myself and I correct the mistakes by giving it another try. Okay, and that's, um, I, I really like that example of that when you, uh, like when you stand in front of the mirror, then you improve a lot of stuff about yourself. And then, uh, and then also with heightened auditory feedback, then you, um, then you also improve a lot of stuff about yourself. In, um, in fact, it's like a mirror, but then on, on, on audition. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, and and um, and just um, just in case people are um, joining at, at episode three, I I, I want to give just a quick summary of what heightened auditory feedback is, and and, and I'll probably do it wrong because I'm. I'm not a professor or anything, but 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 you were saying that heightened audi heightened auditory feedback is basically when your uh, when your voice um, gets piped into your ear, and you mentioned a few different a few different ways of doing that for like cupping um, cupping your um, cupping your hands so that your um, yeah, like um, like that. So um, so basically, your voice goes into your ear. Um, you could do it with he with, with headphones that uh, that rebroadcast your um, your voice into your ear. And and I think you um, I think you have um, four or five different suggestions on how to get heightened auditory um, feedback. So so, so anyway, I we, uh, I'm the professor. So maybe we should start by saying what auditory feedback is, and that's here what you just produced. And heightened auditory feedback is that you hear louder what you just produced. And then how uh, how loud is too loud? Well, if it's not if it's not um, nice in your ear, if you have like this response, it's way too loud. And mm -hmm. and there is no number to give for that. Um, even a raise of ten to twenty decibels is is doing the trick. But it's only for should certain um, time, yeah. So it's not like give everyone headphones and no one in the world will clutter. But it's uh, it is it is a it's something that is working for a little little while when you use uh, devices like headphones, etc. So what we have to teach people with cluttering is to. Um, monitor their speech. You can do that by feeling what is happening in, in the mouth or in the tongue, in the lips or in the tongue. And you can also listen better to your own speech and that you can, you can make it a habit to better, to be more aware of your own speech, to listen to yourself. Because in, in, if you learn a new language, you are, uh, your um, auditory feedback is high. You, you listen carefully. Do I pronounce well? If you speak a language fluently, this auditory feedback is a little bit downsized because we can't listen to ourselves the whole day. Is that that would be too, too um, energy uh, taken? So you know that's the, only when you you speak a new language, like you try to pronounce my name every time, then you have super auditory feedback. It's heightened. Did I do well? Yeah. Um, and this is, so I don't have to teach you how, I only have to, to make sure that it is, the heightened auditory feedback is, is active again. Okay, yeah, and that, um, and that makes sense. So, uh, so actually I, uh, now, that you've, now that you've explained heightened auditory feedback, um, I, I think in one of my, uh, one of my videos, um, I, uh, I got this device, which is uh, um, basically, you know, how like DJs. Uh, so, 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 so I, so I got this really small box that that basically uh, that basically does um, does that for YouTube videos. Like, I, I I can plug in my microphone and then it amplifies the sound a little bit, and then it also has an out um, so that I can I can listen to it too. And, and I'm realizing that 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 that's actually probably heightened auditory feedback because and and, and basically like every um, every DJ that's um, every DJ that's on the radio or whatever um, has has basically basically a device that does heightened auditory um, feedback, which which could be one of the one of their tricks to speaking really well. Um, um, yeah, and, and if you if you refer to the feedback from uh, lip and tongue, you call it sensory sensory feedback. Doesn't matter. It's the feedback on your speech that is important. So. Yeah. And 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 with um, with that, I uh, when when you were talking about like feedback on your um, mouth position, I I got a flashback to speech therapy because they uh, because they mentioned that um, uh, they mentioned that in speech therapy, but I um, I I totally forgot about it until now, um, and and I really haven't thought about like tongue position or monitoring anything like inside of my mouth. Um, oh, oh, oh. Don't, don't make it too difficult, but l let me explain you one thing. If you, can you do this for me? 
like Pac-Man? Yes, this. Okay, and can you do it 10 times faster now? Look at what, look at your hand, what is happening? Look at your hand. No, not at me, at your hand. Fast, 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 fast. Okay, so you see that when, when you're slow, you make big movements. When you're okay. fast, you have smaller movements. Okay. This is, this is upper lip, lower lip. So if I speak slower, I can make more or bigger mouth movement than if I talk very fast. If I talk very fast, also the, the room inside my mouth is limited. So I lose my resonance. I lose my pronunciation. I lose a lot. I lose my voice quality, etc., etc. So only by talking too fast, you lose a lot of skills. If you put people in front of a mirror and tell them, I want to see your teeth when you speak, what they're actually doing is this, and they will slow down. Or I can ask them to slow down and they will do this. Yeah, so it's everything to do with feedback. Okay, and so, so how do you monitor, uh, like, like, are you talking about self-monitoring where your tongue position is? Or? No, not tongue position. It's only opening of the jaw. Tongue position is way too detailed. You don't need that. But if you only say that when you speak, you have to have one finger space between the upper and the lower teeth, it is almost impossible to have a 13 syllables per second if you have this opening. You can't do that. Even you can't do it. For sure you can't. Yeah, so this is just a way of monitoring. It's not the best way, but it is a way. And it is, it's only to see, can you change? Can you make a change? Um, but I don't believe in um, exercises that makes you feel different or funny or whatever, um, mm -hmm. because you will never, then it will always take extra focus or attention to do so. So that's why we have another way of dealing with it. Okay. But in essence, there's nothing wrong with your pronunciation only because you go so fast, you lose a lot of the things that are normal in speech like resonance or pronunciation or things. You lose it because of your rate. Uh, and that, that's, um, that's, really, that's really interesting. So um, it kind of reminds me of uh, one of my theories about the Thai language. So, so, so Thai. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry. This is a total like um, different different topic. But in but everyone language, knows that you live in Thailand, so I, I just helped you a little bit. Okay. So, uh, so, so the Thai, Thai language has long vowels and short and short vowels, and so, so the same word with the long like ah sound can mean um, something a lot different than the same word with a short um, ah sound. And one of my theories is that the that the um, ah sound and the uh sound, when they are shortened and said very very fast by Thai speakers, um, kind of degenerate into like the exact same thing. Oh, there's a lot we can say about that. In in, in the Netherlands, we also have short and long sounds, and I, if you measure them, they're almost the same length. Huh. But if you write them down, it's like ah and ah. There's a difference. But the duration, if you measure it, it's almost the same. It's, huh. that's, you, you, um, can't even, you can't even detect it with your, with your brain. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, anyway, um, sorry, um, sorry for the, um, sorry for the total, like, this was, this was and, fun facts. Um, yeah. And, but and before, a, before people think that therapy is only related to, um, to, to verbal motor, I would, I would like to ask you to give us picture 10. Can you, can you give us picture 10? Yeah, and... Sorry, I have to look up what picture 10 is for well, Picture 10 is the circle with the, it looks like a cake. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. 
So what we were just talking about is only about the verbal motor component and maybe even the only the motor component. But you see that in this drawing, you see four very important um, things that are part of therapy. And for, it, for instance, let me start uh, with the cognitive component in the right bottom. Um, what is important if a, a clutterer enters a clinic and he has a certain idea about the way he speaks or she speaks, and then a therapist tells him or her that his speech is not good, it's unintelligible, or the, um, the message is unclear, that will have a huge effect on the way they think about their way of speech. That's not the way to do it. Um, uh, but what is true is that a lot of um, clutterers come to the clinic with very negative thoughts about their own speech. Um, and some of them tell me, I'm not a stutterer, but I am a bad speaker. So if we work with, um, with, with cluttering, it's important to work on this cognitive component for instance, by explaining what cluttering is, what it is not, and how they can deal with it themselves. So that is an important part of therapy. And we have the communicative component. And, um, you clutter, and that's not a problem, but you, if you clutter to someone else, then it starts to become a problem because the other person maybe doesn't get you or maybe misunderstood you. So it's the interpersonal communicative component that makes, uh, that has a big effect on, um, on the way you behave. And in many cases, people will tell you, I didn't get it, but they will not tell you what they don't get. Um, and the family members and friends can become um, aware of the fact that they can also change a lot in their communication to make sure that you will have better outcome in your speech. And this is for sure um, an issue in families where people tend to speak in the same way. And if one person only is changing his way of speech in that family, that's kind of difficult. It's like, um, four wheels of the car and one decides to go a little bit slower. Well, if you do that in Formula One, your car breaks down and you, you can't finish the game. You know, it's in the family. If you, everyone has his own style and rate of speech. And so if you change one, you have to change the family. You have to change the everything that is happening uh, within that context. So um, have, have you seen that be successful where, uh, where the family brings in the, um, the son for cluttering therapy and, um, and, and, and the family Im improves their, um, their communication? Um, or... Well, let me put it the other, one, in the other way. I never treat one client, I treat a system. I don't believe in treating the child and not treating at the same time the, the, the turn-taking behavior in the family. So everyone is part of it. And if you know that there is a hereditary element in cluttering, it is also a waste of money and time to treat, a, treat one the first and then treat the, the other one a couple of years later, treat the whole system. There's a lot you can do um, for the whole system and people can change their turn-taking behavior, their rate. And at, in all those years, there's one guy and his um, mean articulatory rate was really 13.5. That's fast if you consider five to be um, normal, whatever that may be, but... Um, and his was 13.5. And he, he said, I cannot change my speech behavior if I, if I keep living at home. I have to leave home because at home, everyone is, uh, remains to speak fast. No one is willing to, try to, to help me in this uh, transformation. So I have to leave. 
I have to be surrounded with other people. Otherwise, it's too difficult for me to change my speech. I'm not telling that everyone should move. That's not what I mean. But it's only as an example of how important it is that um, if you change the speech of one in a system, you have to change everyone in the system. And especially turn-taking behavior is, is very important in this, re in this regard. And uh, what about turn-taking behavior? Well, turn-taking behavior means that uh, if you ask me a question, there's a pause and then I respond. But if everyone in the family is fast and also the turns are fast, so one talks, one talks, one talks, one talks, one talks, if you go in that, uh, that style, then there's, there's, it's almost undoable to, to change your own speech behavior. Speech is so automatic, you need to change a lot to, in order to uh, change your speech behavior. And if everyone is doing a little bit, then it helps a lot within the family. Okay, so, so you're saying that if, if a family has more um, turn-taking behavior, then it provides the person working on their speech with no, more- No, 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 I mean, if it's slower. So if the time between your turn and my turn is a little bit longer, mm -hmm. then it has a, a big effect, positive effect on the speech output of a person with cluttering. Okay, so, um, but then if, um, if it's not and people keep jumping in, then the person with uh, the person with cluttering and and actually um, I've noticed this in my speech that one of the one of the ways that kind of breaks uh, when my speech breaks down is when I am talking to someone that that doesn't really do turn taking at all and then it just kind of then I get really really frazzled and my speech is pretty close to its worst when I am trying to. Um, have a conversation with someone that doesn't really practice turn taking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, that, um, that makes. Realize sense. that that therapists are very good in turn taking behavior normally. Mm -hmm. So in essence, that makes it a kind of a natural situation because in real life, people don't wait that long for each other's turn to be taken. And um, so. So, so, so I have a, I have another question on the interpersonal um, communication um, before we, before we move on. So, um, one of the things I've, I've noticed, like a lot of, um, a lot of parents with, or, or I've, I've talked with a lot of parents of, um, of kids, um, kids with cluttering, and um, one of the things that I always suggest is. Um, that that if the if the parent has money, then they should enroll themselves in speech therapy too, um, and um, and then um, and then just because kids always model what their parents do, that the parent uh, the parents should be, uh, figure out how to be really really interested in in improving their own speech, and um, and almost all almost all the time the parents the parent says to me, well, it's it's Jimmy with the problem, not me. Um, and and I want to say, well, actually, I don't know if you're qualified to, um, to um, diagnose that because uh, because like um, you, you could be just like me and have just as bad of a speech as my as as mine is, but nobody's ever told you that um, that your speech is bad. Like even the, even though you're taking your your kid to um, to speech therapy, but 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 anyway, my uh, my question is how. Um, how do you make it into a family improvement effort, um, especially because, uh, like, um, I um, just just people take a while to warm up, um, and, and and I know that um, that I did like took a while to warm up to speech therapy, but how do you um, how do you convince um, family and friends of um, of of the um, of the um, of the client, hey, well, this is a group effort. Well, 
first of all, and, and, and especially and especially because I've, I've never I have, actually had... if I have the option to do so, and that's not always true, but if I have the option to do that, I um, look at every family family member, immediate family member, see if they're uh, how, how their communication is. So we do that by recordings, video, audio recordings at home. We um, so I assessed not only the speech of the kid but also the speech of that of that family and check if there's something to do uh, for the whole group uh, and if so i refuse to be uh, the therapist if not everyone is involved doesn't mean that they have to come to clinic mm -hmm. but if not if the the system is not willing to change i am not helping the kid by giving him therapy or the adult by giving him therapy because I know for sure that he will never be able to do that at home because the system is not working with him. So I refuse to give therapy if they don't work with me. And sometimes, yeah, they think I'm a little bit um, a rude. Uh, that's okay, I don't mind. And sometimes, um, that is quite difficult, especially with younger children and divorced parents. And then um, my interns were, were mostly like surprised, like, what do you do? Like I have talks with the parents and I have the mom and a new friend and the daddy and a new girlfriend. And we put them all together and talk about how can we change? Because I also do not want to be, um, them to, to talk over this kid's voice um, um, within their marriage issues. I don't want that. It's like if, if there are two parents, couples, we talk with the two. If they're brothers and sisters, they, they join. And one of the reasons that I came up with using the computer in therapy has to do with this. That was why I was smiling because when I was an old fashioned therapist and still doing exercises, etc., it took me a lot of effort to get the little brothers or the older brothers and sisters involved. As soon as I started to work with the computer, the next time the big brother came into the clinic and said, How can you, can you explain this to me? How do we do this? How do I work with this? Can I make recordings outside uh, around the corner of the room without him seeing it? those kind of questions, suddenly it became a family issue. So it's also the, the way to give therapy that, that made a lot of change there. And using the computer, I normally before that, when I was old fashioned, not using the computer, I had all these moms with, in, in the clinic. I don't want to be um, negative about it, but that, that has a certain effect. And later on, I had I saw the brothers and the older uh, siblings, and also the daddies in the clinic, and there was like like a real change there. And of course, these days um, the moms are also uh, normally very, very, very good with computers. But I used to siblings; that helps a lot. Yeah, they know so much about computers, so let's help. And that's uh, and that's really. Um... That's really cool, and that's a good, uh, that's a good point. That um, a lot of times siblings are kind of um, computer geeks that can figure figure everything out, and 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 that's a great way of involving everyone. So so I kind of want to go back to you um, to you talking about <clears throat> because I um, I think if I like if I were a recent uh, recently graduated speech therapist and and like my uh, maybe my like fourth uh, fourth client had cluttering. And, and and I watched your video about oh well yeah I would just refuse to give therapy um, I would I, I would say in my head well um, I um, Yvonne can do that because she is um, she's got years and years of experience and 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 she's kind of mastered the uh, the, the kind of tough love of hey well um, um, if you if you're not willing to do this then I uh, then I'm going to reject you. Um, but like, but but the uh, the underlying message is, hey, hey, I want to help. But uh, but but like, especially like if I if I were a speech therapist and I were recently grad 
graduated, I, I don't think I would have built up the skill level to say, hey, well, you need to be serious, you need to involve the family, or I will refuse to give you therapy. But uh, like, I, um, I can't, I, will see um, I can't, um, I can't picture me, um, I can't picture me, and then I can't picture like, um, like um, a lot of recently graduated speech therapists actually uh, actually pulling that off. E uh, even though I can picture you pulling it off really really well. So so, so anyway, uh, one of uh, one of my questions is, um, what's your what's your advice for people with a little bit less experience on on um, on doing that or uh, on on actually using your technique and making it work? What. Well the first thing I will tell you a secret, I did this since I was a very young therapist and I only had one month of experience. Um, and the reason why I did it this soon is because I believed in the early stage already that as a therapist, I am not supposed to become one of their friends. They come to my clinic for expertise, help and training and expertise guidance, and they pay a lot to, to do that. So if they pay me a lot of money for my expertise knowledge, I can also give them the restrictions, how they can use it or they can't use it. And by giving therapy without um, making sure that a person is really ready for change, you can only become friends. You take their money, you become good friends, but therapy is not gonna do it. And in my object, in my, in my opinion, sorry, used the wrong word. In my opinion, that makes you a very bad therapist. So saying I can't do it because and explain it and, and, and look together with the client how, to, how you can solve it, I think makes you a strong therapist and, and that's what your client is supposed to get. And if you don't dare to say something like this to your client, what message do you give? We're going to do some exercises and I know that it's not going to work, but let's do it anyway. That's not, that's not a therapist. That's something, someone to keep you busy and that's not what we are. And it's not difficult as long as you get it, you know. Uh, if, if a clutter um, enters my clinic, he tells me I want to change and I will ask him, do you really want to change? He would tell me, yes, I want to change. It's necessary, etc. So I give him an assignment, we call it diagnostic assignments. I get, only thing I ask him is to call five times a day and pronounce his name perfectly. Yeah? So all the syllables, to do that five times a day and write down a smiley, good or bad. It's not a huge exercise. I can also give an exercise like read out loud one page and make a recording of it. And then these small things, they come back after a week and they tell me, I'm so sorry, Yvonne, didn't have time to do so. Well, that means a lot. We speak 14 hours a day, average, on average, 14 hours a day, and we want to change that. And you tell me that in one week, you didn't even have time to make seven recordings how can you change your speech? It's not gonna work. So of course, after the first week, I'm not saying, well, you do your bad, I'm not doing it. We'll have a look at it again and I'll explain again why it's so important. And then they get a ch second chance and sometimes they get a third chance. But after three weeks, if they're still not able to do very easy exercises, then there's no reason to start now. And I have, I have gone through this with some clients and I told them, you're not ready yet. I understand that you're in the midst of, a, of moving or a divorce or whatever reason there was not for them not being able to do it. So let's make a new appointment four months from now, two months from now, whatever they choose. And let's see if at that time we can do it again. And then if you have the new appointment, in many cases, you can start with good therapy. They are better prepared. If you start without knowing them, they're ready to change. There's a high chance of missing out. 
And that's not good for you. That's not good for me as a therapist. And that's not good for the, for the insurance companies and money and things like that as well. And these diagnostic exercises, um, I, I, I just said to but there are like four or five that you can do. It's so easy to do it and it gives you a lot of knowledge. And, um, and, and, and before we go, um, before we go into that, I have a, um, I have a question. Um, you said, um, you said, um, you, or you, you brought up two kind of criteria of why you would kind of, or why you would tell someone um, they're not ready for therapy. Um, one is if their family, uh, if their family is not going to work um, with the speech therapy. And then the second is uh, when you give them, when you give them very, very basic exercises um, that, that fr um, from the sound of it, um, they could have, um, they could have done the exercises like as they're waiting in your reception, um, like, in the toilet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, like, 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 like they come to they come to your clinic and be like, oh hey, um, sorry, I need to I need to use the toilet, and then um, so uh, so uh, so anything anything besides those two things that you would say to a uh, a client, hey, you're not ready for speech therapy yet. If they cannot um, uh, give me any reason for them to do it. So like you said, I did it because I wanted to change my public speaking. And if the only reason is that their boss wants them to, that is not a good motivation. And sometimes we need to help them with this. Sometimes by only uh, recording their speech and play back, then suddenly they realize how other people hear them speak. And then they have this internal motivation to change. That's good. But if there's no internal motivation to change, the, the risk of having no effect is, is too high. Yeah, and that's, um, that's a really good point that, um, that probably, a lot of, um, probably a lot of people go to speech therapy saying, hey, well, my, my whoever told me to come here and um, and you need them to um, to to somehow like connect that to something that they care about instead of just what their boss cares about before before moving on. Yeah, and and it also happens when you practice on this on the level of language complexity or a level of um, of easiness that doesn't make them motivated again to keep on doing it. So and. And also when you, when you tend to practice with, with words or context or stories or whatever um, that are not related to a person pro professional work or daily, daily context, then they're not motivated to do so. And I would not be motivated as well. Um, so you're an ICT man, I would practice ICT related topics. You know, I would ask you like, um, what and, for you is the difference? Um, what's what's I see? Wait, 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 wait. I would, for instance, ask you to explain to me what the difference is between AI and machine learning. Yeah, that's something that, as an ICT person, you can tell me. But if you were a florist, I would ask you something that has everything to do with um, the the heat of water and the type of flowers I put into face or something. Explain to me how that works. So that is that is that helps internal motivation. So we can help a client, but the internal motivation needs to be there. And um, kind of going kind of going back to what you were, uh, or, or 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 just the whole uh, the whole thing about uh, making sure that um, the client is ready. Um, what, while you were describing that, I was. I, I was thinking of like something, something kind of similarly um, priced to speech therapy, which, uh, which, uh, which could be that it, like if I decided that I wanted to get one-on-one -on -one training from a master chef on improving um, on improving my cooking skills. Um, as you were talking about all of that stuff, then uh, then I think a lot of it would be the same. The, uh, the chef saying, "Hey, well, look, are are, are you really serious? Because we're uh, because we're going to do this, we're going to do this. You're you're really going to learn. And I only take I only take people that are um, that um, that are really uh, that are really motivated. That are this. That are this. That are this. So um, so so I think uh, I. 
a perfect I example. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of what you're describing is is kind of like that. And so, 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 so I guess um, kind of the answer to um, um, someone like uh, um, someone like the myself in my head that had just graduated from speech therapy is, uh, or, or, or uh, had just graduated from uh, from college and 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 has their first speech therapy job is to kind of think um, think of it like that. It, and then I think especially with um, I, I think especially with insurance and that if, that it, that if insurance pays. Then, then kind of the, the cost gets masked and, um, and, and maybe people aren't really realizing that it's a, it's a premium, uh, that, that speech therapy is really a premium service like, um, like, um, like, uh, um, like, like taking one-on-one -on -one classes with the master chef. So, um, so, so, so I really like that. Yeah, um, the funny thing is that if it's a master chef and he tells you you should perform better and it's like accurate slices, etc., we accept it. But in healthcare, we have this tendency to be weak. You know, oh, I understand it, I'll get it. No, 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 I don't get it. This is how it works, and you're either in or you're out. Both are okay, in or out. What do you want? Tell me. If you're in, I'll be in. If you're out. Let's see what we can do in in a later stage of your life. Yeah, and then and then also with the um, also with uh, what you were talking about of, of not being not really caring about if they're your friend or not. Um, uh, that's uh, that's the thing that uh, at least the master chef the master chef in my head um, is really really concerned about teaching is uh, they're uh, they're not concerned really about friendship. They're um, they're concerned about hey well. Um, can um, so so anyway. I think it's um, I think it's I think it's really really good. Um, and and can I say one more thing about it? In return, yeah. I have I have experienced very good relationships with my client because the way I responded to them is also a way of respect. And um, although I'm tough, and they tell me you're tough, okay, but they. No, I will. I'm tough, but I'll work hard for them as well. So it's not preventing friendships or very positive uh, client um, uh, therapist relationships. But it is a client, and he will be. I will be part of his life for a certain while, and then I will leave again. That's natural. And then I want him to do. I want him to be able to do it on his on his own, on her own not needing me anymore. Makes sense. Okay, can I say one more thing about intensity of, th of therapy? Uh -huh. Intensity yes, of therapy. Okay, well, if I explain it to my clients, I always tell them about my son. He was a, um, a professional athlete and he uh, was training for the Olympics. He went there two times and one time he was number one on the waiting list to bed. But um, he, was, he, was, he was a top athlete. The only thing he did was practice every day. When he had a headache, he practiced. When he had, there was something going on, he practiced, he practiced, he practiced. And what we know in changing behavior is that you need at least to change your speech behavior, you need to have at least five instances a day in which you do something to monitor your speech. Five. And you have to, to, you have to write down when you do something. It's not enough to only record yourself or to spell out your name or to read out loud or whatever you do. You have to say something about it. So you do something, you listen to yourself and you give a mark or a smiley or a word, I don't mind. That's the whole part of doing something. And you do that for five times a day. You inform your therapist about it every day, at least once by email. And you do it the next day five times, next day five times, so seven times, seven days a week, five times. So Saturday and Sunday are not free because we keep on talking. So we do it every day, every day for 10 to 12 weeks. And then we stop because then we have changed our way of speech behavior. For some it's 10, for some it's 12. So if, you are, if you're in doubt, take to 12. And if you do that in this way, 
um, you don't have to go to your email as a therapist every day. You can do that once a week or twice a week. Uh, but by sending an email every day and, and every now and then you give uh, some feedback to the, to the client, then that's what we call intensive training. And in, during that time, maybe you see, the, you see the therapist one hour a week, one hour in two weeks. If you know what you do, if you know what you have to do, you don't need to be in a clinic every week, an hour or two hours a week or whatever. You have to do it at home in your normal daily situations. That's intensive training. Do, um, I sound so, firm, do I? What's that? I sounded firm again. Like this. <laughs> Either do it um, this way or we don't. Um, so, uh, so, so don't worry because your um, your firmness is part of your charm. So, um, yeah. So, um, so, and, yeah. and you can be as firm as you want with me. Um, so, and now I, now if, oh, oh, my, uh, my question is after, um, so after, after 10 to 12 weeks of intensive training, are you suggesting that the, uh, the client takes like a one month break from speech therapy or stop speech, speech therapy or, or, or like, like in terms of uh, what happens, what actually happens after the 10 to 12 weeks? Well, you work on one, um, one item for 12 weeks, and then you have a break for two to three months, eight to 10 weeks. And, 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 and by eight to 10 weeks, and, you can train other things, but not the same. So for instance, if you want to, to, to work on pauses between sentences, you do that for 12 weeks. And after the 12 weeks, you can uh, work on let's say prosody or pragmatic skills or whatever, whatever you want. But the 12 weeks are on one topic alone. Okay, so, so you're, not, uh, you're not suggesting stopping speech therapy. You're suggesting, uh, you're suggesting that you don't, keep, you don't keep training on the exact same thing for more than 12 weeks because, yeah. uh, because, because you're, uh, you need to kind of integrate that um yeah, that's how our brain works you know mm -hmm. we have two parts of the brain the little ones in the back and the bigger ones on the top the little ones of the of the little parts of the brain that's the part that you're you're triggering when you are in the first 12 weeks so you tell your brain this is how i want this is how i want this is, and and this little part of the brain I always explain it in this way is a little bit stubborn so we have to do it again and again and again and again and and then after a couple of weeks it says okay you really want to do it in this way okay I'll do it and then it's automatized but if you keep on practicing there's this constant do you want it like this or do you want it like this do you want it like this that's the that's the story of the small brain and for automatization we need some rest um, and how can you explain it to people who do not know about the functioning of the brain? Well, I thought about it for years and then I'm, I'm from Holland, you know, tulip country. Mm -hmm. So I use the tulips. Um, if you have a garden, you have the tulip bowls, you put it in the soil. And in the first week, um, people tend to look outside like, are they already growing, you know, and nothing is happening. And, it's, and after a while, they even think it's not working. But suddenly they come home and they look in the gardens like there are flowers everywhere. And that's the same system. So we put the tulip bowls in for weeks and weeks and weeks. We, we take care of it, give them water, give them water, take care of the soil. Nothing is happening. Then we let go. We forget about it. We give up on the tulip bowls. That's the that the eight to ten weeks that we give the brain some rest and then suddenly you come back and you hear that the speech has changed that there are tulips in the garden that's that's how it works so don't think about tracking or doing an assessment directly after to 12 weeks 12 weeks rest and then after 10 weeks, check again if it's there or not. If it's there, you don't need to go for a second try. If the changes are not there yet fully, then you go for another intensive period for training. 
Okay, and that um, and that makes a lot of sense. So th um, thanks yeah. for uh, um, thank um, thanks for breaking it down because I um, I thought um, I thought you were I thought you were telling people okay um, after after twelve weeks then send them send them home and tell them not to not come back for a few months. Well, no, but in take into account if a person only has external motivation and a little bit of internal motivation that with cluttering if you can go through the first 12 week with intensive training be very proud that you did that and many clutterers do not go for a second trial for the second or third phase there are only a few that can do multiple multiple uh, phases of 12 weeks so make sure that what you do in those 12 weeks is absolutely making a change for that person. Okay, and I think, um, I think we only have about um, eight minutes before you have to go, right? Yes, and there's one thing I have to, uh, that we, we did not talk about and it's important. Uh, in speech language pathology, we do assessments normally. You do all kinds of tests and recordings and analyzes and uh, whatever. And uh, what is the most made error of speech language pathologists is that they make the recording, do all the tests, client goes home, and then they analyze it. In cluttering, it is necessary to be present during the analysis because they're not aware of the problem. So if I do the analysis and I write down before I measure anything, five syllables per second is the mean articulatory rate. If you go over nine, that means that other people will have difficulty. Let's measure. And then I'm, we measure it in the clinic. So, um, so I'm having a hard time like picturing, uh, picturing uh, where, uh, where this is. So, so, so is the client sitting next to you and you're writing on a, like a piece of paper or whiteboard um, um, typical speech is, is five syllables no. a minute. What I mean is, um, I tell them we're going to make a recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an, a blank paper, piece of paper. I'm writing down a number here. I want to show it to you. I've written it down and now we're going to record it. This is the mean for, not, for people. Okay. Yeah. So if you are above it, then you're faster. If you're below it, then you're slower. So we make a recording. Well, and then we make a recording. And especially if there's someone else in the clinic, like a partner or, or whatever, then I ask them to talk together because that's the uh, less focused speech. And then they make the recording and then we play back the recording and we make the analysis. So we measure how many syllables per second that person spoke. And then I show them, this is what I wrote down. And we just measured 9.3. And then I asked them, what does it mean? So I'm asking you now, Joseph. Your main articulatory rate is 9.3. The mean is 5.0. What does it mean? Um, it means that I'm about twice as fast as most people. Well, even more. You are a statistician, are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so how do you, um, cause, cause it takes a long, long time to like codify speech to figure out syllables per, um, syllables per second. Um, uh, no, no, it doesn't. No, I can do it in, I can do it in two minutes after the re recording. So, so do you just, um, and, and uh, I'm going to uh, teach you how I'm going to teach you how next time. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. Can talk to, can talk to you about it and then you have an image and you don't know what I mean. But what, what I, why, why I wanted to say it is like um, the assessment is part of the awareness, a part of the identification what is actually going on. Yeah, so if let's say I have 40 syllables and I count, are all syllables pronounced? out of these 40, I do it together with the client. Both of us have a, have a paper, heard it, heard it, heard it, not heard it, heard it, heard it, heard it. And then we, we check, we have the same number. 
And that's part of the analysis. We're doing it live where the client is. We don't do it without the client not being there. And remember what I said um, is that when I make a recording and I play it back to you, you never heard your speech before in many cases, people with cluttering the first time in the clinic. The first time people with cluttering listen to their own speech. You know what they tell me? Do you know um, what they tell me? <laughs> no, um, no, I, um, I don't. I don't know. I I remember being pretty much um, speechless at, at that point, but I don't remember actually what I said. Well, they're either speechless or they say, wow. And it took me a while to understand the wow. And that's because um, they say wow when they think that I moderated their speech and not my own while I was recording it. So they think that I'm a computer expert. So in making the recording, I did nothing with my own speech in the same, in the same conversation, I changed yours to be very faster. That's the wow response. And the other response is, what? Is this really me? No, no, that must be a bad recording. What did you do with the microphone or whatever? And the other response is silence and tears in their eyes. Or this is what people are talking about. And that's the first moment of identification. And it's a tricky one. If you don't capture that in, a, in the right way and you leave it, then that is the end of the session. People will come, go home with a very negative feeling. So if a person is shocked by it, I always tell them that I'm so proud that this is probably the first time they realized how their, how their speech sounded. And if they hear it now, that's a good sign to improve therapy. And then it already feels different. And that's also a cognitive part of therapy to deal with the, the moments that are not that fun. And if you play it back, but almost everyone hears it at the same instant. I don't have to tell them that's what is going on there. Sometimes maybe a little bit, but but take care if you play back what you do with it. Never leave the client alone here. And and that's um, that's that's really good advice. I think um, of, of of doing the analysis with the client instead of um, instead of um, instead of do, doing the assessment, then going off doing the analysis on your own. And then coming back uh, because if it's uh, because I think that that probably helps to personalize it a lot and to and to kind of remove a lot of the like clinical feel feel to it. Um, I, I I remember with uh, with my experience um, the uh, the speech therapist did the uh, the other way where um, where where she did the she did the assessment and then um, came back and ha had the tape recorder and then press press play on the tape recorder so um, so so um, and and for me it was really really jarring and I um, and, and actually um, probably I was one of those people with um, tears in my eyes as um, as as I was as I was listening to it and so so I I really like what um, I really like what you're describing because if if um, if she had done it together and, and 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 I'm I'm not blaming her because you hadn't written your book uh, th um, this was like 10 years before you wrote your book um, but um, but if um, if she had um, if she if she played it with me and and it had been more of a discovery um, a, a discovery that we were kind of discovering together my speech rate um, then I think that would have helped to humanize it, and and maybe I would uh, uh, maybe I wouldn't have had that um, um, tears in my eyes re, um, reaction. Mm. So so anyway, I think that's um, I think that's really cool, and um, and could and and would definitely help a lot of people to stay motivated because especially after an embarrassing um, if if it's an if it's an embarrassing experience, then most people uh, most people would go home and say, hey, well, do I really want to go and be embarrassed again next week? Um, but, but with the discovery saying, hey, well, what, um, 
Um, I uh, just, I really like your whole approach, writing down, okay. writing down the number underneath and the, one final minute, but I have to say it. If you play back something terrible, let's call it that. That's that's. If that happens, make sure that you also give four or five good moments in the same recordings. I will I will show you in Prague next week um, how to do that. But if you if you have the one and you 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 um, you give also five good ones. The whole feeling is different. I will show you how to do that, but we have to stop now. I really have to teach. Okay. Okay. So uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for doing this. This uh, the session I think has been really, really informative and very helpful. Um, hopefully for many, many people. So, uh, so thanks very much and have a great day. Thank you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.